It's that time of year again. Halloween season. On Blood and Black Rum Podcast, we take this very seriously. So, we're going back to the basics with what we're calling Halloween East 2. Movies that take place on or around Halloween. Your favorites like Hocus Pocus, Ernest Scared Stupid, Terrifier, and more. Tune in all September and October as we smash jack-o'-lanterns and Oktoberfest in equal fashion. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Run Podcast. I'm Ryan from Coldsploitation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host Martin. How's it going? Uh, we're doing very well. Uh, we are attempting to conjure up a nice episode for our Halloween series that we're doing. A Halloween is two, based on the Adventures of Pete and Pete, a very obscure reference to a '90s show. Um. We've been kind of trading off back and forth on our Halloween series by going uh, sort of a horror movie based around Halloween, um, either set on Halloween or just like around the season. Uh, and then we've been doing a nostalgic movie set around Halloween. And la- we've actually done two in a row that were actual horror movies. Um, we did uh, Trick or Treat and then we did Saw 10. So it's it's high time that we tackle another nostalgic movie and um this one this episode liable to get us kicked off the airwaves i think um after all this time this is this is the one that's gonna be our death now the potential to piss off a lot of listeners i think um it's hard when you are going to be covering a you know a prominent movie that is been in the well it's it's been around for 30 years now it is the 30th anniversary of this movie released in 1993 at that time you and i were about four years old uh you were three years old when it released actually because it released in july which is a horrible horrible time disney what were you thinking what they just, what? Did, they just didn't care what they, were you thinking you were like they, let's just drop this in the middle summer they just didn't care. They didn't put any thought into it at all. They're just like, you know what? Let it be fly out into the wild. I feel like they didn't because um, not only did they not they release really it at a weird time, not during the Halloween season, but also they didn't even release it under the Disney name. They they put it out under um, Buena Vista. And at that time, you know, a subsidiary like that, not really that well recognized. Uh, you know, it doesn't scream Disney. So it just, it's no wonder that it released to like not much fanfare. You know, it was just, at the time, like people were like going to see, you know, like summer blockbusters in July. Um, you know what I was going to see at that time? What's that? Because it's the first movie I remember seeing as a kid. Free Willy. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Which, by the way, we're, we're, we're going to cover that one day in the podcast because oh, me. By the river of Jordan, the Michael Jackson song. And I was there for you. I mean, wow. at that time, in 1993, around that time for the summer box office, you had Jurassic Park fucking hitting <laughs> June 11th. And then you go and you try to set, set up Hocus Pocus. Uh, not going to happen. <laughs> it was the highest grossing by, like, more than double of... Summer 1993. So, sorry, Hocus Pocus. Um, you came in a nice 21, uh, <laughs> just above Robin Hood Men in Tights, and getting beat out by Hot Shots Part Du and Son in Law. <laughs> which also, Son in Law, July. Why? <laughs> July 2nd. Dizzy, what were you thinking at that time? July 2nd, Thanksgiving movie. And not just... I mean, it's it's set literally around Thanksgiving. Why? Why would they drop Son-in-Law at the... Okay, well, whatever. Apparently, we've seen now a pattern with Walt Disney in the 90s where they just didn't give a shit about making sure that anything fit with the themes going on here. Um, Drop a Halloween movie in July. Drop a 
Thanksgiving movie in July and then wonder, why didn't they do that well? (laughs) But over time, this movie, even though it had a poor box office, I mean, I think at the time, it actually did not make back its budget. Um, They, you know, it basically totally flopped. It doubled it. It doubled. Oh, it did it double it. Okay. It doubled it. Uh, well, I guess one and a half to, because the budget is $28 million. Mm. Long's office is 47 point Well, no, no. that's That was not the gross at the time. That was probably later on. But at the time, what I'm seeing uh, was it the box office was like gross 32. So um, it, did, it definitely didn't do very well. And, you know, it had a revival later on. Um, it got picked up by... A few different channels. Um, I think mostly what would come to be known as ABC Family um, was probably the biggest draw for this. I think it probably did also play on Disney uh, maybe a couple times, but not to the extent that it has now. Um, But I think ABC Family was really the place where it started to grow and grow in popularity. And it's kind of a a similar idea as uh, Christmas Story. Uh, which also did not do very well when it first released and then kind of got it picked up steam being played on TV and people catching it and being very um, enthused by it and so it just became sort of a classic of the time and this movie has that same sort of appeal um, especially for kids who grew up in the probably the late 90s early 2000s would be the time where uh, it really started to pick up steam because I can't remember Fox, I mean, ABC Family used to be Fox Family. It used to be a subsidiary of Fox. And then at some point, and I don't recall the exact time frame, they switched over from being Fox Family and they sold it to ABC and then became ABC Family. Well, ABC um, is owned by Disney. Yes. So they basically bought up, and I don't know when it was. Uh, well, I was say, did I say Disney didn't merge, uh, buy out uh, Play Century Fox until like not that long ago. It was like a couple of years ago. Right, yeah, no, it wasn't actually, a, I don't think it was, I think literally they sold the channel, the, the rights to the channel, and they sold it to ABC instead of, like, a merger or anything like that. Um, but I don't recall exactly when it was. But I think at that time, oh, uh, 2001, um, was when they switched over. So that does that does jive. Yeah, around, probably around the early 2000s, it became ABC Family, bought by Disney, um, and that's when this movie Hocus Pocus really started to become a hot commodity a a family named film she would watch it Halloween time see that's not the story for me I saw it like a true 90s millennial on VHS from my local rental store a million times so you were the ones you were you were a person that was actually supporting the movie yeah, and it's released prior to it getting popular on the TV. Yes, I didn't see it in theaters. Don't remember that, um, but I definitely do remember it being rented constantly and seeing it that way. And um, I think that's the same for my wife. My wife seems to have seen it a lot when she was a, a kid, even before you know ABC Family had brought it back. That's not the story for me. Um, I didn't see this movie for a long time, or if I did, I, I think I had seen it. But it wasn't something in my household that we were like, every year we're throwing on Hocus Pocus and watching it. It was, Which, which makes no sense, because your sister's a Disney princess. You know, I'm not really sure, but also my sister had always been very scared of any sort of uh, Halloween or horror movie. So it does make sense that she maybe Hocus Pocus would not have been a draw for her. Um I was always that I know, person. That, I know that movie poster is so scary with <laughs> sparkles in a vacuum. Je- Sarah Jessica Parker, you know. I know that sounds outlandish, but it's true. I mean, she just would stay away from movies that even could have been somewhat scary. So, um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a household commodity for us. We were not watching it every year. Um, like I said, I had seen it, but it probably it took until I actually. Um, started dating my now wife where I actually watched it again and and because she was like you you don't know Hocus Pocus well and I was like no I don't know I don't know I mean I've seen it <laughs> they're like do I know it by heart no I don't know it by heart so 
I mean, it kind of took until then for me to actually get into Hocus Pocus. And again, it's still personally for me, I should say this. I mean, my wife's in the other room, so I should say this low, but it's not my favorite Halloween movie. Um, it's, it's definitely not. It's, um, it, it is a fun movie, uh, for me. And we'll talk about, you know, the things in the movie that make it fun and, um, why it probably has become such a nostalgic classic, but at the same time for me, and I think for you as well, um, I find it just okay. It's just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a Halloween movie and I like that part of it, but I just, I don't see the huge appeal. I'm so glad for you to get that off your chest, Ryan, because I do not feel that way at all. Thank God for you to be the first one to say it. And what do you mean? St- and may we stone you for your yeah <laughs> horror. That's right. That's right. It's, I can't be a cult <laughs> film fan without really loving this movie. No, but uh, we'll talk about you know how I feel about it, where I think like the where we where the downfalls are, the pitfalls of the movie. Um, and also sorry to Mick Garris who. Uh, prominently, wrote, you know, co-wrote this this movie. Um, we've we've covered his other, you know, well-renowned movie, Critters Two. Do you remember the uh, the, uh, the Easter mo- the Easter one? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I forgot we did that. Ah, oh, what a horrible movie. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, all right, but before we get it too far into talking about Hocus Pocus, let's take a break because we got a special on the show today. Uh, we actually have two different beers um, comparing the two because I was able to order and get in time. And get in time, yeah. Um, I was able to order from KCBC Brewing, which uh, we've had on the show before, I think. Right? Did we have it? We had we had we did a couple. We have yeah. I think we we had pause two on here, right? Yeah, we did that one. Um, I was able to order KCBC online. For those of you who are not in the know, that stands for Kings County Brewing Company, based out. Nope, Brooklyn. nope. Sorry, collective. They're they're a collective. Kings County Brewing Collective, Brewers Collective. Yeah. KCBC. They're a bunch of car, bunch of commies. Yeah. But I was able to order, and they posted it uh, very recently. I saw it online, and I was like. I- I got to fucking order this. Um, they were po- they had posted that they just put up on their website both a fest beer and an Oktoberfest. And I knew they'd had the Oktoberfest because that was something that I had been meaning to order um, like for a while because they've, they've had it out for probably about a month now. Um, but I had not seen that they had a fest beer until they posted about it. So I had to quickly run to their website and order it. And also, luckily, you can order a half case or a full case, and either way, you're getting free shipping if you're in New York State. So I was I was which, very pumped about that, which is great too. Because if you ever in the state, at least I don't know. I don't I mean, honestly I don't know how the many other states allow for ordering of alcohol since COVID. It's been a blessing now that we can. But I mean, the fact that they also allow free shipping is that's you know bonus points to you good fellows because the shipping itself makes it very unappealing for a lot of these things like oh it's gonna be $84 for your 12 beers and then you go like okay and they're like shipping costs is another $3 You're like hey, you know what maybe not worth it. yeah yeah that's that's the big problem it's like shipping itself is like buying another pack of beer basically and um that does really add up especially when you consider like now you're paying almost like Twenty-five, thirty dollars a four pack at that point. So, for KCBC to offer free shipping, it was it was definitely a steal. I I, I loved it because I got it for basically the price that I could pick it up at a store, and it's not guaranteed that any stores around here are actually going to have these beers. So, I gladly ordered it. And um, so, we have on the show both Shadow Crypt Fest beer and the Zoktoberfest Marzen uh, or Mertzen, if I correctly say the the pronunciation of that type of beer, <laughs> uh, which I don't normally do, um, I don't say it correctly. So, um, but I think the the interesting thing about KCBC is that they're making both a fest beer and a, and a Marzen because uh, 
not many places do that. I mean, most places are pretty much cemented into the Marzen style if they do make an Oktoberfest. Um, that's, you know, the traditional American way to make it. And um, almost everyone makes it that style. But I said, you know what? I got to try both of these because I'm curious to see how KCBC's Fest beer uh, compares to their Oktoberfest. So we have both on the show. Um, and both of us have cracked open the Fest beer first, uh, which means I haven't even tried the Oktoberfest yet. Um, have you tried the Oktoberfest? Yes, for this I am right now. And um, let's start with the Fest beer. What do you think about the Fest beer? I like it a lot. It's damn good Fest beer. It's got a nice little hoppy bit to the bit uh, beginning. L- slight brightiness to it. Very drinkable. Very refreshing. As the Fest beer style is supposed to be. Very clean. I love it. I think it's a really good Fest beer that they got here. Um, I would definitely get it again. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, they do uh, put the type of hops that they're using on the can here for both of these um the fest beer has tetsudanger hops um and i think it's really really solid because it does have that lighter feel to it it does have on the on the first sip you really get the pronounced hop uh which is nice and crisp and clean and then towards the back you get on uh, a malty or breadier note but not like supremely strong um you know just like a nice flavorful breadiness to it uh it's very easy drinking and i think the fest beer is a really really good style for them um this is quite tasty uh now moving over to the oktoberfest the the oktoberfest marzen style what do you think about that one disappointed mm. it's okay for an oktoberfest it is brightier. The hoppy presence isn't as noticeable as the Fest beer. Much more focused on the bread, uh, multi bread toads. But it is kind of watery. It's a little lifeless. Um, not much to it outside of like, you know, like a bready maltiness in the beginning. And I mean, it is clean and crisp. But the fact that it's just little bit of brightness and then the beer's kind of got this like watery taste to it it's not bad but this is not a Oktoberfest of Mars and style that I would go back to I think uh, a little disappointed there I think this Oktoberfest is not bad I think that they've so basically this one I think of it is it's it's still fairly crisp it does have um a much more pronounced breadiness to it um it's it's seems very similar to the fest beer in that it still has like some of the characteristics of the fest beer uh even though they did use different hops for this one um but it it, this one it just seems like they've you know they've really malted it a bit harder it's it's definitely got more of the um bready kind of like toffee-ish notes although i would say again it i don't think it goes as far as some of the other mars and styles which um tend to take on more of like a caramelish characteristic um maybe not as flavorful as some of the other other oktoberfest that i've had but i think it's a fair oktoberfest from them um i think in terms of comparing the two shadow crypt versus the zoktoberfest i do prefer their shadow crypt and it's hard to say whether that's because we have so many Mars and styles that we are, um, I, like maybe I'm more open to the best beer style in terms of, um, a difference of flavor profile than what I'm normally drinking for Oktoberfest. So I, I don't know. I, I do prefer the fest beer though. Um, which is not always the case for me. You know, a lot of times I do prefer the Mars. And so I think this Oktoberfest is fine. Probably not the best Mars and style that I've had. But I think their fest beer really knocks it out of the park. Um, I would I would get both again. I I would get both again. Interesting, uh, interesting tasting though for this one. Right? I do think after all our little fest beers that we've done this year, though, is kind of 
making me more like not I don't prefer them over Marsons, but that is making me be like, ah, yeah, these have I can understand why they're like, hey, let's add this to the pretty act. Right. Appreciative of the Style. change up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad uh glad to have ordered these though. It's cool. Now I like having a tasting like that on the show too, where you get to sample a couple different couple different ones and compare. It's cool. Um, all right. Let's talk about Hocus Pocus. Let's get into it. Uh, let's, uh, let's fill our cauldron and, uh, make a potion here on Button Back Run Podcast. All right. So, like I said, we're, we're 30 years into Hocus Pocus, which is in itself surprising. I kind of sometimes take a look at Hocus Pocus 1993 and I'm like, oh yeah, like 10 years ago, right? Came out 10 years ago. (laughs) Just the Uh, other day. No. The other day. I mean, I was only four years old, so um, I'm 33 now, so, or 34, sorry. Yeah. 30, wow. 30, wow. 34 don't, years don't, old now. Don't short, don't short change yourself like that. Goodness. Um, so I, mean, yeah, I, I would say I've been rounding up for like a year and a half now. <laughs> People ask me how old I am. I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm 34. I'm not even there yet. Could be this old. Yeah, I mean, it is surprising uh, that, it, you know, it's been out for so long but at at the end of the day i do i see the nostalgia for it because i i understand i understand where they're coming from i understand that in terms of the time period um the all the nostalgia factor of you know especially if you caught it on abc family or uh what's now become freeform uh during their what I think used to be 13 days of Halloween, and now it's blossomed into 31 days of Halloween. Where's my 31 days of Degrassi? <laughs> Hitting such hard, you know, hard epic uh, tale. No Degrassi for you. The only thing I remember being on uh, ABC Family back in the day was Seventh Heaven. That's the only thing I remember. And I no one in the family watched. About the 700 Club, you didn't tune in for that at 10 o'clock at night or something? Oh, every you know, every now and then I'd like to hear Pat Robertson babble on about something. Yeah. Um, but I understand the nostalgia for it because uh like I have the same sort of nostalgia for like AMC Fear Fest, USA's Fright Fest, whatever they would do during Halloween. I was gonna say Dutch. <laughs> Dutch, I guess, yeah. Um I have the same thing for it. And it doesn't like in some of my nostalgias don't actually factor into whether I like or dislike something. Like, one of my nostalgic things that I would used to do is uh, get home from school, hunker down with a Halloween placemat, plastic Halloween placemat, grab a glass of milk, fucking dig into a sleeve of Halloween Oreos, and I would eat an entire sleeve before dinner, sitting there on the floor with my Halloween placemat. And I'm not talking I was like eight years old doing this, I was probably like 14 years old doing this, you know, uh, with a Halloween placemat. Um, And what I would usually do is turn on the TV and that TV channel USA, which has kind of fallen out of favor now. um, But at the time, USA was kind of a big, big deal, playing a lot of stuff. Like Law and Order on 24-7. Yeah. Monk, stuff like that. Um, (laughs) They used to have a pretty extended Halloween movie marathon too uh kind of like what amc does now with their fear fest and um i used to turn that on and i um distinctly remember a nice halloween season where they were playing i know what you did last summer and we've done i know what you did last summer and we talked about how as a slasher movie it's not that great um definitely doesn't reach screen levels uh from kevin williamson but it was it did turn into a nostalgic thing for me to kind of think about it in terms of, yeah, I, at that one time, that one year, <laughs> I watched I Know What You Did Last Summer on TV during Halloween, and it became one of those, like, shining memory moments for me. I don't know why. Seeing Ryan Philippe be like, Whoa! Don't know why, but it did. It did. And then, um, I don't know. It's just... So I understand. I know. I know why. Because you were fourteen and you were seeing and, Jennifer Love. And she, she, Jennifer yeah. Love, you went running around and you're like, 
feelings. J J Love was running around in her gimpy tight top, and while well, Rachel Lee Cook Silva or or Jessica Biel running around in her skimpy white top. Um, so I understand where they're coming from with Hocus Pocus. Uh, for me, the nostalgia is is not as uh, intense for Hocus Pocus. Um, but the appeal, I think, is for me at least for me is the the wide range of Halloween that we do get to see on display in this movie. Because it, it if anything else, it is very um, decorative and does capture the feelings of Halloween pretty well, in my opinion. How do you do? You, do you agree? Yeah, no, it's a very Halloween, Halloweeny film, which you don't often get to say or see with these films because it's one of the first things, especially with this uh, Halloweeny series that we've been doing, is creating the Halloweeniness of it. And Hocus Pocus is thoroughly Halloweeny. It's thoroughly within that whole uh, niche. I think, however, though. Uh, it kind of goes off the rails story wise. Mm-hmm. This is coming from somebody too. Like I do have great nostalgia for this film because I've, like I said, I saw it a billion times when I was a kid uh, on VHS. It was a. And was that your choice or was that your sister's choice? I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. I don't think you think we chose. I think mom and dad chose. Or your parents were like, "Hey, this would be yeah. great for you guys to watch." I don't. I yeah. I don't know who chose it. I just know it ended up in the VCR from the rental store. Um, back in the early '90s, and I saw it a billion different times. With so it my like, dad's rental store. Yes, it was. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, it That's was. Because right. this is uh, this is before uh, we moved to our uh, what was then our current house. This is still over back in the trailer, so. You know what? Maybe that's why it wasn't a staple of my childhood because the Martin family always had it. <laughs> I, I, we weren't able to rent it because my dad's like, I don't know. It's always out. I don't know. Somebody keeps fucking taking the VHS. I don't know. Some, some asshole keeps renting Hocus Pocus and Mortal <laughs> Kombat 2 for your Genesis. So no, right. so no, Ryan, you can't play Mortal Kombat 2 or watch Hocus Pocus. That's right. Yeah. So that that must be it. That must be why it wasn't it wasn't played. It, it is very Halloween-y, and there are a lot of things that I remember, like, as a kid. Like, me and my younger sister used to always be like, oh, bye-bye, like, at the end. Mm-hmm. Do that, and, like, we'd be like, you know, Hollywood, and have little quotes like that. But when you watch this film now as an adult, unless you're one of those uh, millennials who are stuck in the Disneyland... And think everything Disney's delightful. Um, it's enjoyable to a point, but it kind of its stick is very thin. I agree with that. I think that you know there are things about it that I do like, um, and like maybe you know we can talk about some specifics after. But one of the things that I I find about Hocus Pocus when I watch it is that I think you're right. The stick grows weary uh after a time because i think that there's only so much um that you can actually put up with from the witches themselves because they do have like a a, a cheesiness that is difficult to maintain and uh find interesting what's fun what's funny as a seven-year-old listening to bet midler be like <laughs> just sarah jessica parker that'd be like hey honey and then I smell children. I smell children. <laughs> oh, after ninety minutes, becomes tiresome. And I think it's the same idea with uh, Ernest Scared Stupid as well. Like we talked about that in Ernest Scared Stupid. You know, for maybe for kids, it's a little bit more interesting to see Ernest have uh, multiple personalities. But you know, it, when it comes down to it, as an adult w- trying to watch that, it is uh, so schizo that you you kind of like tune tune out with it because. You know, it just doesn't hold your attention like it it would as a kid, um, and I agree with that. I think that that's definitely part of the part of the problem. I've always felt too that Hocus Pocus runs a little bit long. Uh, it is about almost an hour and forty minutes, and I feel like a good chunk could be cut out of it. That's kind of unnecessary for the plotting of it. Um, th- there are times where in the middle it does kind of lose itself in um, unnecessary 
excursions with the witches and things like that where I, I've always felt that it could use just a, a little bit of a cut to it to um, make it just a little bit less long. I think, so I think too, Hocus Pocus, is, I, I agree with that, is also kind of why, um, why like in a couple of years you'll see like they're like, all right, we're not going to put and put out a full-fledged 90 minute film of this shit anymore we're gonna do smart house and you know look at the irish mm -hmm. you know all of these like made you know made for disney channel movies because it does kind of have brink you're gonna have like you know those kind of uh you know that kind of because it is kind of like a uh a prologue to what the you know disney channel films would become yeah, like a, it's it is a precursor. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned that mentioned that because you know we didn't do Hocus Pocus two when it came out last year, but Hocus Pocus two specifically for me really really felt like a Disney Channel movie. It felt um, right in line, which is not something that I would I like I, I I know what you're saying. It is a precursor Hocus Pocus is, but I wouldn't say that Hocus Pocus itself is like right in line with another Disney Channel movie. It still does feel like a bigger budget movie. Um, it feels like it was written for uh, children and adults in mind, which is not necessarily how it occurs now with Disney movies, especially ones like this that are uh, basically banking on nostalgia. Hocus Pocus 2 was definitely written for only people that know the first movie and children. It wasn't... It's not like this you know, where it would go out of its way to have some sort of uh, risque humor, um, like Hocus Pocus does, it cut out all of that and it really went Disney-fied. And I think that was part of the problem with the movie itself, um, which I really disliked. I did did not like that movie at all. Um, but it, it just Disney-fies things so much that it doesn't really, it, it, it truly feels like a Disney Channel movie instead of its own entity. With Hocus Pocus, I think it, it kind of, it doesn't fall into that trap so much. Especially because at that time, Disney Channel movies didn't exist. Like, not in the, not in what we think of as, like, the prime time of Disney movies. Um, but with this one, I was surprised to see that there is a lot of risque humor. Like, probably one of the best things about the movie is when it, the witches get on the bus. And the guy's like, oh, 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 you know, basically cat calling these witches. And they don't really recognize that it is cat calling because they're just, like, um, not used to you know, 300 years later, uh, contemporary, uh, stuff. So, um, I think that's probably one of the better things. As, and uh, the other thing that I really like too, is like when they show the, the dance party and, um, the mom is Madonna and she's like, well, if I'm, a, I'm Madonna. Like, like, Cone. right. Like, Cone obviously, bra. I mean, like, obviously. Right. And yeah, she, you could see with, with her comb bra and you could see like, she's kind of so self-conscious about, how she's looking in that outfit with like the cone bra and everything like does she really resemble madonna i like that too i thought that was pretty good um you know so the risque humor well, at times well, works but i mean no that's also like as we talked about when we did like our the you're scared stupid like the, there is a like uh a, a adulty teen edge to early 90s disney films that you know have totally been lost and sanded down and thrown to the wayside as, you know, they've become more sanitized. Like, uh, you know, Hocus Pocus is made during the, you know, Disney Renaissance where that kind of stuff was still allowed. Because, again, our protagonist, Max, from LA, <laughs> Hollywood, dude, you know, uh, he just, they just moved to Salem. He doesn't like it, man. But he's he likes a girl in his class, Allison, and he's like dry humping a pillow. <laughs> and then his little eight year old sister Danny catches him, and then when they meet up at a party, he's like, "He loves your yam wabos. He talks about your wabos all the time." And it's like, kids, that means boobs. He's talking about boobs. He likes your boobies. Not only that, but he's talking about like a sixteen year old's yabo is in this. Uh, you know, in terms of being uh politically correct I, I i don't know that you know referring to uh vanessa shaw's yabos is something that a disney channel movie would normally do especially at this time and uh and 
how you know how Disney Disney fies things up. But uh, like I I think like I like that a lot. Like the the whole idea of of uh, the film trying to at least adhere itself to adults. Like it, if it's not going to completely interest adults, at least there are those moments where it's it's funny. It's got. It's got that humor that's going to appeal to adults who are watching it with their children. Um, Though, they do cop out a bit in the beginning where we get to see 1693 Salem, Massachusetts and Zachary Banks, you think, may just have speech impediments. Why not Zachary? Because nobody, nobody's been named Zachary in their life. I refuse to believe that unless some douchebag millennial gave their child... That poor name. But, like, running around barefoot in the woods to catch, you know, uh, the witches, and his little sister gets turned into crone stew, and he becomes a cat, and they're just constantly like, since we lost Emily. She died! <laughs> Say, just, it's, it's, it's like, just like, I don't, that's one thing I'll never get with Western, it's not just America, but with Western shows in general. Why do you refuse to be like, <laughs> like, if you were to like watch like an anime and like, like, you're watching Naruto, it's a shonen. People die all the fucking time in it. But if you're watching Legend of Korra, which is also a show that was meant for teenagers, hey, anytime a plane shot down, you can see in the background somebody flying out in a parachute because nobody can die. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you, you can have all this violence. Yeah, they don't really, like, want to refer to it as such, but uh, then, you know, obviously she's been around for 300 years as a ghost because they show her, you know, towards the end, and she's a ghost now. It's like, of course, you know, especially even 300 years later, she's she's dead. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, and I think they do actually... Do they say at no. the end when Thackeray the cat, Binks the cat, um, is, like, basically collapsed, do they say he's dead? I can't remember now. They say he's gone. He's gone. Mm. God. They don't say he's dead. Gone. He's been shuffled to, uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's like Boy Scouts. You're never. The only time they mention the die thing is when he gets hit. And they're like, again, Dolly Hewitt here. When the cat gets hit by a fucking boss, the guy's like, speed bump. <laughs> <laughs> We're running over the cat, and the cat's flat and guts not everywhere, just flat. And they're like, no, thanks. And then his lungs come up, and he's like, see, I told you I'm immortal. Yeah, just he basically blows himself up like a balloon, <laughs> pops himself back into place. Um, yeah, I mean, I like I, I like those moments. I in as we were talking about, love the Halloween parts of it. The Halloween parts actually. And also, like, probably the 90s fashion, too, like, which is has now become back in style again. Like, if you look at all the, the fashion, like, kind of looks like you could be looking at today's world. Um, but, like, the Halloween style in this movie really makes you reminisce for the times where um, the Halloween decorations were... It was like everybody had the same ones, right? Like, you would go to um, the store, you know, or, like, a convenience store or um, maybe... Ames, a department store, <laughs> and there would be an aisle of Halloween stuff, and everybody would have that same stuff because there was a limited amount. It wasn't like Target and Walmart or having their own production line and making their own shit and you buying stuff online. No, everybody had the same stuff, and it really makes you reminisce for kind of like the simpler times of like going out to the store and buying cheap decorations that everyone would have. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's just me, but like I, I find the nostalgic element of the decorations, especially in like Hocus Pocus. Um, we talked about it too. The opening to Halloween Four, um, which is you know very decorative. Those types of things with those nostalgic decorations and like the cutouts and stuff, um, always really get to me because that's like part of my childhood is re- remembering that stuff. Yeah, it was great, too, because, like, not only was it, like, simpler, but, I mean, think about the times when you did run into that stray house on your trick-or-treating quest, and they had all the bells and whistles and bullshit. 
you know, you're like, whoa, the skeleton's talking to me. And now, I, like, you know, every other asshole who's, like, really into it's got their own, like, shit set up. And it's like, all right, you know, now it's just a pissing contest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the spectacle is kind of gone now. But, yeah, you're right. Like, you would notice if someone went the extra mile and they had a lot of different stuff. Um, Blow-ups now have made it kind of difficult to be impressive because you could have, you know, like, I ordered this $600 blow-up online or, you know, I ordered the 15-foot skeleton or um, recently I saw somebody had, like, a fucking 30-foot Michael Myers on (laughs) something like that. It's a ridiculous thing on display like that. Um, Selling used cars. Yeah, basically, yeah. It's like a wacky, waving, inflatable arm guy but it, the michael myers michael myers version of it <laughs> so yeah the, i think the spectacle of seeing that stuff has kind of faded over time and um i like seeing these this, you know these movies where they kind of bring that nostalgia back so I, again i think with the, the halloween stuff on display that's really nice as well just getting that classic nostalgia of halloween's past um and all, we also should mention too that the kids in this movie are actually de- um, trick or treating at a reasonable hour. Um, they, they're not coming out at two o'clock in the afternoon after school and their Halloween stuff trick or treating. They're going out at a normal like six o'clock to nine nine p.m. time and, and doing their trick or treating at that time. Um, but one thing about Hocus Pocus that is questionable, and it's the same idea with like Halloween and Halloween Two, is the time period of when all of this takes place is very loose and almost like a lucid dream uh, where it's not quite apparent sometimes like how much time has passed, where the time's going uh, you know it, it, it kind of plays fast and loose with the time scale of this movie yeah it's very confusing because uh I don't ever remember a dawn taking place at like at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, trick or treating. It seems like they're trick or treating, like you said, like at like six o'clock at night, which would make sense because it's dark now. We're not even at Halloween yet. It's already been you know dark. Gets dark by five thirty, so that makes sense. Like, but I mean, at the end of the day, though, it still kind of seems a little like too much shit happens in that second act. To like make it seem like it's all happening on one night. Yeah, it's 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 like the Halloween and Halloween Two aspect of it, where at least in Halloween Two they do kind of make mention of the fact that like oh, you know, all of the events in Halloween kind of took place like b- before eleven p.m. and then all of the events of Halloween Two are like after that. Um, it's like one long fucking night, <laughs> and I think the same thing is true of Hocus Pocus. Like all this takes place basically on Halloween night they they go out trick or treating then they go to the museum the witches museum when they let the witches loose um, and then at a certain point they they kind of like after all this stuff has happened uh, the dance party's going on and the witches have been there and they do their song and dance and Bette Midler has to rope out a, a ballad for everybody um, from my desk stands God rest your soul Disney <laughs> please let please let it rest instead of doing Hocus Pocus 3. <laughs> um, it's coming out. It, it is, yeah. Yeah, they've already greenlit it. Wait, so. you killed off Bette Midler before she dies? She's not dead yet. I'm not, I'm not, tr- I'm not trying to kill her off. I'm just saying let her, let the lady rest. <laughs> give her, give her a rest. If she wants to settle down and her golden years, then let her do it. Don't force her into Hocus Pocus 3 because she needs to pay the 20% Medicare doesn't cover. <laughs> um... But, like, after, the, you know, after the dance party and Halloween party and everything, um, and they are shown at the school, when they go to the school, and they actually show you the clock, and it's, like, at 3 a.m., and uh, they think that they vanquished them in the boiler room, or whatever the fuck oh, that I, thing is. No, no, no. See, I always thought it was, like, a furnace, like, in, uh, like, in Home Alone, like, a giant mm-hmm. furnace they're getting thrown into. No, nay, nay. But due to your beautiful 4K... Uh, Blu-ray of this. That's a fucking ceramic kiln. 
Oh, like a firing kiln in yes. the art department or yes. something? Yes, which our kiln in our art department was not even close to being that. It was literally just like a fucking little weevil wobble, like, you know, that you threw in. They have a whole giant fucking brew house of a kiln for those batteries. Yeah, it's weird because it almost looks like they're in a fucking crematorium or something. They're like... Yeah, you know, this school also doubles as the local funeral home because we're Salem and all, you know, um, it is a weird place. But yeah, I guess uh, I guess it makes sense that this school has a industrial kiln. I don't know why. And, uh, you know, and the, the funny thing is, too, though, we don't see beforehand like that they're in like a ceramics class where they have this, you know, this ability. It's just mm throw right at you like there's no setup to that you know there's no you know that yeah, punch line like, with nothing there like they don't set up like oh he's a you know Max is he's very artistic or at, or maybe Al probably Al Cindy she's artistic and he loves the way that she you know sits there and forms the pottery and puts it in the kiln before they go out you know for treating yeah I mean it does come out of nowhere um, but like, I like that you have them show you the time. It's like 3 a.m. They think they're done. They're like, yeah, well, you know, 3 a.m. Technically Halloween's over, right? It's November 1st at this point. Well, not only that, he gets to lay with the girl. That's right. Gets to have his wet dream. That's what I was expecting too. Like as an, as an adult now, like when they're waking up, like, who oh, like her to be like, is he your fucking dick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is funny too because uh, Sarah pointed out she you know, in in a, in a different movie, but this one it works for this one as well. It's like well, if Stephen King had written that, they'd already be doing it right now. They'd be, be like, "Well, before we vanquish the witches, we we must have sex." Um, but is it is true of this one too? You know, and especially I think that's another one of those risque things too. It's like, wait, these two sixteen year olds stayed overnight together, sixteen or seventeen. You know, yeah, they, they don't say. Oh my god. So risque, so and then not only that, what the thing that I found funny too is um when Max goes out because he's like they're like oh we got to get home you know it's it's you know in almost morning um I better get home before my parents know that I've been gone and think I've been canoodling. Uh, <laughs> um, he Max goes into his parents' room and he's like mom dad it's like you know it's like four o'clock in the morning he's like shouting because he doesn't he doesn't know they're not there. We know they're not there because they're stuck at the dance party. But he goes in shouting. It's like, dude. Mom, uh, man, I didn't have sex today. <laughs> I know, right? Like, you, you're trying to escort a girl out of your house. Like, maybe you don't give it away. It like the, that. But It was the 90s, man. You just being open at us. Like, Mom, Dad, there's a girl here. Let the wet dream on your shirt. <laughs> but, uh, the... <laughs> yeah, I just, I just want to be honest with you guys. Yeah. No, but uh, yeah, I thought that was funny because it's, you know, it's kind of crazy but then then i like too that he's like oh it's like five o'clock in the morning they're not home they must be having a really good time at that dance party no, 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 when no, have no. your when have your parents ever been out that late no 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 the question you need to be asking is why has the sun getting close to rising up the sun literally rises at noon by the time november 1st comes around the way this movie acts <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're already having brunch and mimosas by the time the sun's coming up. <laughs> um, what do you think about uh, good old Billy, the the zombie that they conjure up from the dead? Stupid. Uh, the only thing I can think of is I remember being like as a kid, being like when he's like, "Go to hell, hang!" I'm like, "He cursed." That's hilarious. I just like that, um, even back in 93, Doug Jones was getting so much work. You know, he's Billy B- Butcherson in this movie. Uh, he's gone on to do tons of different monsters in pretty much every movie, every big movie that you can think of. He's worked with Guillermo del Toro quite a bit in The Shape of Water and Pan's Labyrinth. He's been in What We Do in the Shadows, the TV show. You know, he, he does a ton of shit. But even back in 93, they were like, yeah, you're going to be Billy Butcherson. I mean, it's okay. The zombie element's all right. I mean, I don't... There's nothing really to it. It doesn't really... I remember the zombie, you know, the costume, obviously, but I don't think it's, uh... 
that is something that I write home about. So I guess, what do you think is the film's biggest issue? You know, if, if you're saying uh, it doesn't really reach the heights that you remember it having, uh, or at least, you know, nostalgically uh, watching as a kid what you liked about it. What what now, as an adult, is like the biggest thing that kind of puts you off the movie? It's mainly that the story is so scatterbrained and all over the place and kind of stupid. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I, like, I am fine with the premise. I am fine with the idea of like, because I I do like the opening. I do really like the opening in sixteen hundred, you know, seventeenth century Salem, which is they do they they do their thing. They get hanged, make a curse. We get to follow what's going on, and it all gets set up. I think it's fine, but once they're brought back. I think a lot of like what the Sanderson sisters are brought back, a lot of what's going on is very hit or miss. Like some of it works, some of it doesn't. And the fact that it's just constantly running around in circles around that same idea is what hurts the film the most. This the film's main issue is just pacing and story. Because I think overall the acting is really good. I do think Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy. Uh, Jimmy do a really good job as the Sanders. They are entertaining, especially Sarah Jessica Parker. Like I, I love how ditzy and stupid she is, and it's like really fun. I think, you know, Thor Birch as Danny. She's a really good child actress, and she does a really good job in that role. It's a lot, and she's a lot of fun. I think Vanessa Shaw is great. Her as Allison, is, she's really great in this film. Really believable. Really entertaining, grounded. I think Omar Obari Katz as Max is like the weakest link because he's just very generic dude, bro. Mm-hmm. But I think overall the acting is really solid throughout this film. I think that we do get really good performances throughout. I think, like I said, I think it's more just more or less just the fact that once you get to the second act and what's going on, What's happening is very hit or miss. Some of it's fun, some of it's not. Some of it's entertaining, some of it's really dull shit. The whole, like, town hall party thought that bit was fun. The whole wandering around the sewer and then in the graveyard and like, oh, there's a zombie here. I thought that was boring because that takes up way too much time. Mm-hmm. You know, and the fact when you get to the end of, like, how they were, like, capturing Danny... And then you think like, oh, Max is going to sacrifice himself. It's so fucking stupid because Danny's a very smart eight-year-old. So why if Billy's head gets kicked off and she's like, don't worry, I'm going to run out of the circle of salt that I was told to stay in to grab your head and be like, here you go, Billy. And then she gets you picked up and then Max is like, I'll sacrifice myself. You know, it's all very me and me. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that I think the pacing is one of the the issues of the movie there are things that that do work and things that maybe don't hit as um humorous as they should or seem to be like too out there too too much ex- excursion for the movie um i mean there are things too that i think like i i, I do think that the story is a little bit weak when it comes down to the fact that it has to constantly explain the rules of the of what's happening. So, like, literally, the, the witches have to, like, speak out loud, like, oh, S- we need to... Sisters? Make- sisters? We need to try it. <laughs> yes, they, they have to literally express what they need to get across to the audience, like, here's the rules of what's going on on this Halloween night. Um, So I think that's, you know, that's a weak point, because it has to just do an info dump here and there. Um, But I think what works is... Like, just the the idea of this Halloween night, this adventure, um, the uh, a lot of the um, illustrative set design as well is what really works in the film's favor. Like, the initial lead up to the museum where they're, uh, where they used to live, uh, where you see, like, purple smoke coming from the chimney and it's all, you know, kind of digitally decorated for the how the Halloween season and you see all the atmosphere very good um one thing I should point out too is if you look when they're coming out of the school you see this nice 
nice change, color changing tree, right? Like it's yellow, vibrant, very uh, fall esque, especially for around where we live. And then you look in the background, and literally every other tree is fucking green. Like green as can be. Um, kind of like at at a certain point, you're like, oh, the foreground. Wow, it's so folly, so atmospheric. And then you know, if you're looking closely, you get re- taken right out of that magical element because you're like oh wow (laughs) the background they forgot to change any of the other trees back there um i thought that was funny but yeah i mean i think the film's pacing is the biggest issue it does it does um seem to just overstay its welcome a little bit and i think for kids that might not be such an issue because kids tend to watch movies and get sucked into them they get sucked into them and they don't have the lack of attention span that we as adults do now where I don't know I don't know if it's me and if if I've changed over time and gotten sucked into like phone culture and everything else like that but I definitely have a limited attention span for movies now I I don't I can't if it if it doesn't grab my attention I do have a difficult time just sitting down and watching a movie um I feel like that's just been a, a slow and steady thing that's occurred over time is that we our attention spans have just kind of gotten a little bit shorter um and so now even like a a hundred minute movie seems just just a bit too long um so i think that's kind of what happens with hocus pocus too kids are more open to um accepting just what's happening on screen and they don't really think critically about like um Does it seem unnecessary to actually see that scene? But now as an adult, you're watching it. I feel like you notice when it seems like the film is running long. Um, what else did we talk about that you wanted to mention? So in the opening, when, uh, Thackeray goes down and visits the witches and he kicks their cauldron over, notice anything? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to. So as he pushes the cauldron over, again, the cauldron is steel or iron over a hot flame. Oh, it's on a hot fire. Uh, yeah, and on a hot fire. Just pushing it around willy-nilly with his hands. <laughs> like, it's okay. Took That took me right out of the film, Dios. He, he, it would have it been more realistic if he grabs it and his half his hand melts off. <laughs> He's just... Just ah! yeah. <laughs> yeah. a Wilhelm scream. Yeah, his, his, his punishment is living with third degree burns <laughs> for the rest of his life. Yeah, I know that that took me right out. Of the no, I I didn't notice, but yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. No, anytime they're ever kicking the cauldron around, it's always like right over open fire, and they're just pushing it around willy nilly. It's like works. One thing I like too is uh that i I found to be you know not disney friendly anymore is when um ice and uh what's his name Uh, jay Jay are over the cauldron they're like caged up uh being kept by the witches and instead of helping them out max just like i'm taking my shoes back and just leaves them there to who knows could could be eaten right um I found that to be funny because, like, it's you know, you'd think like the your hair hero at the end, it's gonna save save everybody. No. Yeah. No, but he no, but also too, this movie proves Max is a bitch. What do you do when some assholes come rolling up to you and be like, "Hey, man," got which also shows how like anti kids friendly this movie is today. Hey, man, you got any smokes? <laughs> <laughs> You know, these high school kids are shaking out another high school kid in the graveyard smokes. He's like, no. And he's like, like, how conscious Hollywood? Well, how about money? And he's like, no, I don't have any. Like, oh, you don't have any money. What about them Jordans? I did like that, yeah, with the smokes. That's that's definitely not something that you would ever see in a kid's movie anymore. It's like, te- even, even the worst teens, you know, bullies, in they the kids' smoke. movies now, they're not smoke. They're if, not. if they were, they'd be like, "Whoa, what are you doing?" It's cool, uncool. 
Don't you know that will cause cancer? Yeah. Yeah, they oh. definitely are not smoking. Also, too, the one bully, Jay. Um, Dude, he looks he, a lot like Shawnee Smith to me. I was going to say Brecken Mayer. You think Brecken Mayer would be playing him? Yeah. I mean, the eyes and stuff, his eyes, they definitely they looked a lot like Shawnee Smith, um, at, at least to me. You know, so Shawnee Smith's man. Back better than ever. They, to me, they're like Bulk and Skull, which, fun yep. fact, apparently... Mighty Morphin Power Rangers didn't come out until August of 93, so... Who's aping from who? Mmm. There you go. Yeah, that's true. But every time I see him, all I can think of in my head is, like, the Bulk and Skull theme, like... Don't you like how uh, grunge they are, too? Don't you also love, too, how they're picking on an 8-year-old... As they're trick or treating it, hey kid, give me your fucking candy. <laughs> yeah. What? Um. How do you feel about like the the horror element in here? Does it does it have any? No. None. It was zero. I mean, it does seem like it. The horror is uh, mom's Madonna Bracco. It's true. It's true. Bam! Sticking right out. And I gotta say, probably my least favorite mo- moment is the the song from Bat Midler. Because I put a spell on you. I feel like I feel like that was the start of every fucking movie and TV show throwing in a music number. Like now, everything's got to have one, or you got to have a music related episode. Um, and to me. I I hate any time a show or a movie has like oh we're gonna throw in a musical montage where the the character actually sings it. Um, it's like one of my least favorite things of what they do now in 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 like shows and movies. So anytime there's a musical number, I am very dis- <laughs> disappointed that it happened. So I I. Uh, would say that's how I feel about this movie too. One of my least favorite scenes, and I hate it every time it comes. Up. Um. All right, so I guess we we got to rate Hocus Pocus. Um, so on a scale of zero to ten, Sir Jessica Parker yabos, because I'm surprised that Max doesn't bring up her yabos during. Their encounters. What would you give? With her nice little corset pushing them. Yeah. I'll give the film a 7 out of 10. I do still have like, a lot of nostalgia for this film. Because this is a film that I have seen like a billion times. And it's a film that does still, like, it does resonate with me. But I can see, like, I don't think it's that great of a film overall. It's fun, it's quirky, it's got its little you know, things going on for, but it's, this isn't masterclass theater. There's not say <laughs> there's honestly, like if you're not a millennial who grew up watching it, you're going to be hard pressed to probably be, to find the enjoyment. And that's because there's a lot of early millennial humor here. A lot of early millennial, st- you know, tropes and stereotypes. Um, I do think it is really Halloween. So that's a plus. I do think, it's got some good, you know, good ideas. I do think the acting overall is well done. I think the fact, though, that the, the main problem with this film is that it's slow, it's bogged down with a, a lot of nonsense, and it could be a lot more focused if the plot wasn't in the second act jumping around from place to place to place. Um, but I would definitely say check it out, because it's it is called Classic Place, boy, so whether you like it or not, I do think you should check it out. But I'd say it's a 7 out of 10. Like, it's a fun enough film. But if you're not of the age that saw it when it came out, you're probably going to be hard-pressed to be impressed with it, so. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I would give it a 7 out of 10. Like, I do enjoy the movie, do watch it pretty much every year. I think it has a really great Halloween atmosphere. Um... For me, it's definitely not my favorite Halloween movie to watch during the season, but I do understand the nostalgia for it, even though I may not necessarily have it to the same extent that other people do. 
it does have um some fun moments to it i think that you know the witches are interesting there are some nice excursions as they encounter uh contemporary life um i like the 90s throwback that it's got in it um but at the same time i do have and have always felt that it was just a little bit long uh has some somewhat of an uh aimless direction at times and um i feel like it just this the shtick does wear thin over time um to the point where like i think you can only for me at least i can only watch it like once a year um any more than that and i would you know i can't focus on it that long because i do think it loses me at times as an adult that maybe childhood me would not have found to be as um you know annoying or off-putting so i think it's a fun a fun movie has has a lot of great moments um and i understand why people do like it so much but I don't have that same draw to it, even though I do think it, you know, it, it is a worthy movie to watch during the Halloween season. Um, if you're looking for atmosphere specifically, this one's got it. You know, it's got a lot of atmosphere. It's got a great um, classic Halloween feel to it. But as a story and as a movie, I don't think it's quite there. I, I don't think it, you know, captures your attention as an adult. Not like Double Double Toilet Trouble does with Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. I mean, come on. Oh, I've seen that movie. <laughs> Soon. Yeah, I uh, actually, I think I tried to watch that one not too long ago, and I definitely could not get through it. <laughs> it for an adult, it does not hold up. I don't think any of those Mary Kate and Ashley films. Right. No, I I don't think so. All right, so that's the nostalgia of Hocus Pocus. Uh, what do we got next? I don't know, you're the keeper. What was on the list? I don't even remember. Wow. I mean, we've we've gotten through a lot of the stuff, so I'm like, now I'm like, what the fuck else was on? <laughs> what else did we say was on the list? Um, I think we hit everything that we said was on the list. Yeah, like, we've covered all the stuff that we definitely wanted to cover. Um, I don't know, like, may, is there room for the exorcist believer? If you want to make time for it. It's like I'm I'm kind of uh, throwing in like a, a big scythe because while I do think we should probably do it, I'm also not excited to do it. <laughs> um, especially because, well, for one thing I've seen that's getting terrible reviews, but also because I'm just... Do we do do we really want to go another Halloween season with another David Gordon Green flop? Like, feels like that's been that's going to be three years in a row now. It's like, get tired of it. You want, go give him a pep talk. Hey, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I know. I know. You can have, you can have imagine it, it's that these people are so out of touch with reality. I mean, once you get that insular in Hollywood, you're like. Oh yeah, like, this is gonna be fucking great. No one's there to tell you like it's fucking stupid. Nobody would sign off. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's a trilogy too. It's gonna be a trilogy, and David Gordon Green may not be brought back for the second one. Is what I've seen. I don't even think it's his fault though with the direction. It's not like the movie are bad, poorly directed. They're poorly written. Hmm. Well, I mean, he does write it, but it's him and, like, what? Like, seven other people, though. What if... Yeah, I mean... What if... Because I'm having a hard time, too. What if we do, like, The Conjuring? Well, that doesn't really meet the Halloween requirement, in my opinion. But it's based about New York! No, I mean, I, I, I've got some other ideas, but I, I do think probably the next one should be the exorcist believer it's in theaters i think i think we should do it you want to do the amity bill cast on halloween either though yes, it is. It's, it's not halloweenies like uh your cri- like we like we said your criteria is too narrow i i like i'm not out of movies though that's the thing i'm not out i've, I've there's more there's more i've got more weeks to go we just we just didn't pick them 
um we didn't like go out that far what if but what if we did like uh a list like some are you afraid of arguments uh, they don't take place on Halloween though. Just, yeah. <laughs> You're so fucking finicky. It sucks. Make the snow. Hold on. <laughs> is that, is that Halloween? We'll just do uh we'll just do Tales of Halloween again. No. <laughs> I'd rather do body bags. I don't know. Well uh We'll talk about it and see what else we can do. Um, but I, I do think that we should do the Exorcist Believer. So try to get, get there and that, see how that. How is that Halloween? Uh, because it released around Halloween. That's that's my that's my criteria for that one. And because it fits the theme of David Gordon Green So at Halloween. So Zombie lands on the list of Country Living's 70 best Halloween films. <laughs> Yeah, that's because they didn't follow our criteria. Number six is okay. Halloween H two O. Twenty years later, Candyman twenty twenty one. Scary stories to tell in the dark could be one that we do. I think I suggested that. I think we, we, we've the, been meaning to do that, right? Yeah, I think I suggested that, and you said, and that one does take place on Halloween, so that could be one. Arachnophobia. Oh, and Ginger Snaps too. Children of the Corn. Ooh, when we're gonna do like all like twelve of those film films. You ever seen the uh, Ginger Snaps? No, never even heard of that. It's a werewolf movie. It's a good movie. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So we'll 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 come up with some more and we'll we'll carry out the Halloween season. Wow. So who do you like? Who do you like more? Do you like the Sanderson sisters or the Crones? What do you mean the Crones? From The Witcher Three. From The Witcher, I think the the crones are obviously spookier, and uh, I'm I'm more drawn to the spooky. So I would say the crones. Yeah. Crones are awesome. Yeah, I like the crones a lot in the in The Witcher. It's probably one of my favorite parts of the the game. Yeah, I like I like that a lot. All right, so. Thanks for listening to our episode on Hocus Pocus. We hope you enjoyed. Hopefully we didn't uh, ruin your nostalgia for the the movie. Um, we are on pretty much any podcast app you can think of. So you can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, our home base at Anchor.fm, which is now Spotify. Uh, leave us a nice review. Subscribe to us on there. We're on Facebook and Twitter. Search for us, Blood and Black Run Podcast. We have an email address at bloodblackrumpodcast at gmail.com. Write to us. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what movies you want us to consider. And uh, we will definitely think about it. And then you can also donate to us on our Patreon page or on our Spotify page. Uh, any donations you give to us will go right back towards beer. So we appreciate that. Thank you in advance for anything that you can give. So that concludes our episode on Hocus Pocus. Hopefully you will tune back in for our Halloweenies 2 episodes as we continue all through October. Hopefully you're having a nice Halloween season. And uh, until the next episode, take care.